Well, welcome to Crave Church, everybody. I am super glad that you're in the house, literally your house. And uh, if today's your first time here, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Marlon, last name is Medina, and yes. God has given me the beautiful privilege to be the leading founding pastor of Crave Church. Hey. So if this is your first time with us, I just want to let you know that this is family. This is home. Say it with me. Wow. Welcome online. God bless you. So we're glad that you're in the house. Today, we are doing week three, say it with me, of our If the World Was Ending series. And it's been crazy. The responses that I've heard have been incredible. They have been amazing. I know that a lot of people are starting to really understand the importance of why we do need a savior, which is Jesus. And uh, that the end times are not really supposed to be gloomy or scary for those of us that are in a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. And so this brings hope to the Christian body, the, the, the body of Christ. And today, tonight, we're going to be looking at how things are going to actually come to a complete end. Um, how things are completely going to wrap up. And so we'll, we're going to be looking at three very monumental events, very key events in regards to the end times that will play out yes. during these moments. And uh, one of them is the final moment where... Uh, this is the last thing human humanity or human life will ever experience. Wow. And I can't wait to share that with you in just a bit. And that's going to be pretty much the heart of my entire message. Yeah. Right. But before we get into all this, I just want to do a quick recap. Um, and here's a timeline that's going to appear on the screen right now. We're going to have the rapture and this rapture will trigger a um, seven year period titled the tribulation. And this seven year period is divided into two periods of three years and a half like you see right here on this um on the screen with the timetable that we have yeah. um the first half is when god allows seven judgments to happen yeah and these seven judgments are called seven seals mm. this is going to happen in the first three years and a half of the seven year period called the tribulation right. then we have the second half and this is what we call and what we know as the Great Tribulation. In here, we're going to have 14 judgments in total. Seven are titled the Trumpets and the other seven are titled the Bulls. So this is what's going to make up the entire 21 judgments. Seven seals in the first half. And then we have seven trumpets and seven bulls that symbolize the Great Tribulation. So it's going to be worse than the first half. Yeah. Yeah. And then we see that we have Armageddon. And that is at the end of the seven-year period. And then that's when Jesus is going to come back. Wow. Now, it's these judgments that prove that this last book of the Bible, which is called Revelations, isn't symbolic or a reference to something that happened to the primitive church. Yeah. And the reason why we know that is because all of these judgments have never happened yet. Wow. None of these judgments have ever occurred. We've never seen this in our history. We've seen some of these things, um, but not the way that... The Bible depicts some in the book of Revelations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to be focused on the seven seal judgments. That's going to be our focus. And then we're going to be looking at what's going to be happening in heaven mm -hmm. while these seven uh, seals are happening here on earth and the seven trumpets and the seven bulls. We're not looking at the seven trumpets today. We're not looking at the seven bulls because we won't have enough time. But there's a show called the John Ankerberg Show that really depicts this. And I think I might put the link on the YouTube video for this sermon okay. so that you can click on it and actually research it and see it for yourself. Nice. After we look at the seven seals, we're going to be studying what's going to be happening um, in heaven mm -hmm. to all of those that were raptured, yeah. uh, to those that were saved by yeah. Jesus. And then my third point for tonight will actually be uh, looking at the final judgment titled The Great White Throne. Um, this is the final experience, the final event that humanity will ever live in uh, before um, all our sentences for eternity are pronounced. So let's get into my first point. And the first point is called The Seven Seals in the Tribulation. I'm going to read them very quickly because, like I said, I want to focus on the third on. point. Yes. And uh, that is the heart of my message. So here's just a small depiction, a uh, small description. We're not going to be elaborating too much. Uh, but you'll kind of get the gist of what the world's going to be like after the rapture. Um, I want to talk to you about the first seal found in Revelations chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. It says this, As I watched, and I means John, John is receiving revelation of everything that's going to be happening in the end times. Yeah. And he writes down what Jesus speaks to him and what Jesus showed him. And he said, As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Seven seals represent judgments. Yeah. Then I heard one of the four living beings say, with a voice like thunder, come. 
I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and the crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. So the, this first seal that John talks about that's going to happen as soon as the rapture takes place and it begins a seven-year period, this first seal is the first horseman of the apocalypse, the first horseman of the apocalypse. And this first horseman is actually the representation of the Antichrist, yeah. oh. the one world leader. Yeah. Okay. So this seal is going to be broken, which is a judgment. Yeah. And the judgment that's coming is in the form of a white horseman. That horseman represents the Antichrist, the one world leader. Here's the second seal. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. Wow. So this second seal is the red horse of the apocalypse who will cause great violence during the tribulation. And you can already tell that violence is not a very difficult thing to imagine at a large scale. Yeah. Just take a look what happened this year with all the looting, mm -hmm. the riots, and all the things that were happening around the world. Yeah. Um, you can see that chaos is not that hard to start. Yeah. And so God is going to send this judgment through the form of violence. So if you thought that what you saw over this year in 2020, over the, the riots and all the looting, if you thought that that was crazy and it was scary, which it was, this red horseman of the apocalypse is going to be an evil spirit that's going to create this chaos, but at a higher scale. Wow. There will be tons of violence wow. on the earth during the seven-year period. Yeah. There will be no peace. Wow. Here's the third seal. It says, when the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, come. I looked up and saw a black horse and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, a loaf of wheat, a loaf of wheat, bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. Wow. And don't waste the olive oil and don't waste the wine. Wow. So this third seal is the black horse of the apocalypse. Okay. This black horse, what he's going to be bringing to the earth is a great famine. Right. Wow. There will be a scarcity of food. Now, none of us really feel afraid of that. Yeah. Right. And I was even thinking about it yesterday. I'm like, oh, what if look, the supermarkets ran out of food and my neighbors can have, I would totally, you know, feel free to share all my food and I wouldn't care because I'm thinking from a full belly perspective. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm not thinking from a hunger perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But just to give you a small taste, just take a look at what was happening during March, yeah. April. Yeah. What was happening in the supermarkets? What were all the memes that we were seeing? Yeah. Empty shelves, yeah. right? The no more toilet paper scared a lot of you yeah. because how would you deal with life if you had no more toilet paper? Yeah. But let's take this to a deeper scale. What would happen in life when there's no more food? Yeah. We don't get this too much because we're not in a third world country. Right. People from third world countries understand the pains of hunger. Yeah. And even those third world countries that experience pain and hunger still have organizations that help out sometimes. Wow. But what are we going to do when the world is going through a famine? Right. Yeah. What's going to happen to you, the children that have to be seen by their parents? Right. Starve. Yeah. Wow. What's going to happen when you are being threatened at home for the slice of bread that you have on your table? Wow. Yeah. You got to understand that this is not going to be Something like, oh, well, you know, I'm used to, you know, being hungry and whatever comes my way, I'll eat it. The thing is that there won't be a whatever comes your way. Yeah, right. This is why in some parts of the world, you'll see people searching for food in dumpsters because hunger can make you do that. Wow. The fourth seal, Revelation chapter six says this. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death. And his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. That's crazy. So this seal may be the worst out of all four. This one horseman of the apocalypse is the worst out of all four because this could be a plague that will kill one quarter of the entire world's population. Then it'll bring more wars and it's going to bring famine. Wow. Look what happened with 
this entire pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Look how the world changed. This is going to be an evil spirit that is going to be released yeah. to bring plague and kill one fourth of the population. Wow. That's millions and millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. And for those that stay alive, it'll bring more wars and more famine. Wow. Let's look at the fifth seal. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. Mm -hmm. And all these martyred souls, they shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Mm -hmm. Then a white robe was given to each of them. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of the brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. So this fifth seal tells us that martyrdom is going to be a really, really big part of this seven-year period. Yeah. And this is just the first half. This is the tribulation. Yeah. This is not the great tribulation. Yeah. Right. This pales in comparison to what's coming to the second three years and a half. Yeah. But there will be martyrdom. People will be martyred for, the faith, for their faith in Christ during this end time period. And then we have the sixth the seal. And it says this. In chapter 6, verse 12 and 14, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. Earthquakes are pretty scary. The sun became as dark as black cloth, so the sun will lose its light, and the moon became as red as blood. Holy smokes. Seems like a horror movie, right? Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. If a star falls on earth, my goodness, the sky was rolled up like a scroll and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their place. Wow, It's very interesting. You know, right now there's a flood happening in Central America and I visited um, my country, Honduras in Central America a few years back and I was looking at pictures of the airport that I had been in. Did you know that the airport that I had been in when I visited Honduras is now completely covered? Oh, wow. Can't see it can't see it it's covered in water that thing was huge too yeah. it wasn't like you know a tiny little building of like one story no yeah. it was a building where planes used to land yeah. Yeah. now covered you can't see it yeah. there's a person that received a vision of what the future world map was going to look like a lot of what we know as the world a lot of the islands that we'd like to visit gone wow. Oh, wow. gone mm -hmm. mountains gone mm -hmm. covered right islands gone yeah. covered as well and then um, it talks about, right, that this, this seal, when it's broken, um, uh, uh, this devastating earthquake will occur, causing massive upheaval and terrible devastation, along with unusual astronomical phenomena. Yeah. I think that anytime the sun goes black, it would create a lot of panic in our world. Yes. Yeah. Then there's a seventh seal, and it talks about, in Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 2, how when the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was a silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. Now, I don't believe that's a literal half hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. So the seventh seal introduces the next seven judgments. I believe that these judgments, these seven seals, will happen in the first half of the seven-year period, the seventh seal will introduce the next 14 judgments or the next seven judgments, sorry, at the halfway mark, like I showed you in my diagram earlier. So all this is going to happen here on earth. And this is not even the worst part. The worst part's what comes after. But like I said, we'll post a, a, a link to the John Ankerberg show and you can kind of see what the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of judgment really mean. But while all this is happening on earth, in the heavens, we're going to be having something called, and this is my second point, the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, the judgment seat of Christ feels like a scary term, but it's not. Um, this is for all those who have been raptured. Uh, we will be in heaven experiencing what I'd like to call the Oscars of heaven. Wow. This is where every single Christian that was raptured that is in heaven during a seven-year period here on earth, yeah. they will be experiencing the testing and the rewarding of their works. Mm -hmm. 
the, the testing and rewarding of the works that they did while they were here on earth. Wow. And we catch a little bit of a glimpse on 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. So Jesus right. Christ is the foundation that we build on. Yeah. Right? Right. We don't build on a brand. Yeah. We don't build on a leader's name. Yeah. That's right. We don't build on any of these things. So this is, by the way, I want to say this, that when a pastor falls, the church should not fall. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because the pastor or a leader or a brand or a name or a church is not the foundation that we build on. We build on the foundation titled here, Jesus Christ. So I'm not really a fan of people saying, oh, my pastor fell, so then I guess I'm going to walk away from faith. Why the hell would you place your faith on another man? The Bible says, cursed is a man who places their trust in another man. Yeah, true. Your faith should never be placed on me. Yes. Your faith should never be placed on your parents right. or your grandma. Yeah. Your faith should never be placed on a family tradition that was yeah. passed on. Yeah. Your faith should always be built on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ alone. More on that, but I could actually, uh, I need to stay focused. And here's what verse 12 says. Anyone who builds on that foundation, they may use a variety of materials like gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. Two different categories. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives the builder will receive a reward. So this is where all of our kingdom work will be tested and rewarded. It's going to be like a huge lit party happening in heaven. If you think that parties are crazy here on earth, wait till you go to like a place where it's paved with gold. And this is where um, God will reward us for all that we gave, all that we did for God's kingdom. And hence, this is where Jesus, you know, warns us and says, don't store up treasures on earth. Right, yeah. Don't store up treasures right. on earth like many believers do. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, instead, store up treasures in heaven. Right. Because you could be a Christian building with gold, silver, and jewels, which is eternal things. Or you could be a Christian that is building with wood, hay, and straw. Wow. Right. Temporary things. And for those that are building with jewels, uh, gold, and silver, mm -hmm. you're going to have a blast during the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. You're going to be celebrated. You're going to be celebrating. But those that are building with wood, hay, and straw mm -hmm, right. are the Christians that really focus on the temporary things. Wow. There's going to be a lit party for those of us that really gave our all to God's kingdom. Yeah. But for those that didn't, yeah. for those of you that didn't, it's not going to be too much of a fun moment. This wow. won't be too much of your benefit. So let's read this part. It says, if the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. Wow. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Wow. So he's saying, you're going to pass, yeah. right? But you're going to pass by 50%. When you pass a test at school or with whatever it is that you're being tested on, you don't, I mean, for some of you, you just feel glad that you passed. So 50, you're like, you're like, I'll take it, right? C minus, C minus, I'm good. But I want us to be the type of church, Crave Church. I want us to be the type of church that doesn't settle for 50 or 51%. I want us to go for 100, for 100. And if we can go a little higher, let's go even a little higher. I want us to show up to heaven and say, you know what? My works are gold. Yeah. They're silver. They're precious stones, right. jewels. I want to be the type of Christian yeah. that brings a pleasure to God. Yeah. I want to be found pleasing before his sight. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen to this next verse. This next verse is very interesting for those of you that are more temporary, earthly bound. Yeah. First of John 2.28. And now, dear children... Remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Wow. So shrink back in shame, this begs the question, how? Well, these will be the people that believed in Jesus, mm -hmm. but they didn't use their faith to fulfill the call that God gave them. Wow. Although this will be a moment of reward, of celebration, it's also going to be a deep moment. 
Maybe a moment of realization and regret for those that focused more on earthly things rather than the eternal ones. And by me saying that you focused on it and on on eternal things, I'm not just referring for you um, to. I'm not referring, and I'm not trying to say drop your work, drop your job, your career, and then just become a pastor right. <laughs> or become a worship leader. Yeah. You know, this doesn't mean that you're that 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 you're 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 eternally bound just because you only do ministry. I believe that you can do eternal things through your career, through your workplace, through whatever creativity and arts God designed you for, your business, whatever. But the purpose is the focus and where you channel the resources, where you channel your heart towards. Mm -hmm. If you're in business, you can still do eternal things. If you work anywhere else other than a church, you can still do eternal things. As a matter of fact, God wants to use your life in your arena to do eternal things. So I'm not saying drop the business. I'm not saying drop your education. I'm not saying drop the job and become a pastor or live in the church 365. I'm not saying that. Although maybe some of you, God is calling you into ministry. And God is saying, what I designed you to, what I designed you for, what I designated you to is for you to work in my kingdom, wow. vocational wise. Right. It's either or. It could be both ministry or it could be in your secular job. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the point of this message is saying, are you using what God has given you? Okay. Are you using what God equipped you for? Yeah. For eternal things. Yeah. For souls. Right. For his kingdom. Yeah. Right. right? For the spreading of the gospel. For making an eternal impact on those that are around you. Are you using what you have? Yeah. Or are you using what you have for yourself? Wow. For selfish gain? Yeah. Yeah. Selfish ambition? Right. To have an image of a successful CEO, yeah. businessman, yeah. always yeah. dressing up in tip-top suits? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I used to get tip-top suits at uh, Metro Town uh, when I was in like grade 7. Hate them. <laughs> No offense to tip top. I love you guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is this. Are you building an image for yourself that at the end of the day, when you get to heaven, God's going to be like, what a waste. Wow. What a waste. Yeah. Your wood, your hay, your straw, it's going to burn like that. Right. And you're trying to get the approval of man, the approval of Instagram, the approval of heart. When what we really should be working for is the approval of God. That's right. Because at the end of our life, what will matter is what Jesus says to you. Amen. The moment that his eyes lock with your eyes. Wow. Yes. How are you standing? Are you going to stand with confidence before God? With courage? Or are you going to shrink back in shame? Mm-hmm. I have a small video that I want you to watch in regards to how this could really play out for people. Okay? Here it is. Question. What are you called to do? ask that question because we won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do in life. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occur. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account of your stewardship on earth. Evangelist Anderson, I'm not an evangelist. I'm an accountant. I, 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 I had an accounting firm. I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I'm an, I'm an accountant. I, I had an accounting firm. I, I, I help churches. I help ministries with their, their, their finances. Son. Where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. Accountant Jones, step four and give an account of your stewardship. I 
accountant. Jones. No, no, I, I'm not. A I pastor for 35 Jones. years. I, I, I had a, a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,000. 321 souls. If you would have sought me, I, I would have revealed this to you. Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. raised three children. I, I never preached to, to nations. I, I never even been on a, a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you the 1,579,541 souls those three children impacted. sought me and you heard my voice. You were obedient to my call. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did you will be judged according to what you were called to do. So it's those who love God, mm -hmm. get connected to him and fulfill his will that will have the confidence on this day. Wow. It's those who love him, yeah. who get connected to him. Yeah. It's those who fulfill his will, yeah. his desire, Amen. that could actually come with courage before the Lord. There's a lot of parents in our church that don't attend our church, but your children do. Mm -hmm. wow. yes. And maybe tonight you're watching because we got quarantined again. Yes. <laughs> and I want to talk to you parents just for a few seconds. And I feel this from the spirit of God wow. to tell you this. Yeah. Yeah. This world is really coming to an end. Yes, right? And you're so focused on temporary things. And God is asking you to switch your perspective. Wow. Yeah. And that's up to you. Yeah. But what's very troubling to me is when your children are getting close to God. Wow. Yeah. Your children, your sons, your daughters are wasting their life on an eternal God who saved them. Yes. Right. Yeah. And you get upset. Wow. Come on. And you get angry. Preach. And you battle your children. And you come against your children to build a relationship with God. And you're trying to destroy the very thing that God sent his son to die for. Wow. Come on. Can I tell you something, parents? You're getting upset because your children are using their time to work in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And you're considering it maybe a waste of time. I don't know what you think. Wow. But can I be honest with you? Mm -hmm. You fight so hard to take them away from the church without realizing that when you do take them out, you're not going to keep them in wow. because the enemy is working too. Wow. That's right. So many parents have taken their children out of Crave Church mm -hmm. to only find out that the time that they were investing in the church, they're going to end up investing in something else with someone else, wow. something that is not going to edify their last moments alive mm -hmm. on earth. Okay. And then here's the problem with many parents. Mm -hmm. 
they end up calling me a year later going, can you please ask my son to return? Can you please get him out of the drugs? Mm. Yes. Can you please help me help me with my son? He's he's drinking. Mm -hmm. He's with bad friends. Dang. But it was your doing. Wow. Ooh. Come on. It was your doing. Yeah. Come on. Right. You were the one that took him out mm -hmm. from the house of God. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Psalms 1 talks about being planted in the house of God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of the saddest things that I could ever think about is how there are parents that uproot their planted children. Mm. Dang. What you don't understand is this, that if they don't invest their time in the house of God, mm -hmm. they will end up investing it somewhere else with someone else. That's true. Yes. And you will lose all control. Yep. Yes. And then you're going to regret your decision, wow. wanting them to return. But for some cases, sometimes they get so bound and chained by the enemy in addictions, through addictions, mm -hmm. through drugs, alcohol, yeah. through promiscuity, Maybe car accidents. Maybe they're not bound in a specific way to an addiction or a drug, but maybe they're bound to a wheelchair. Wow. And if you would have fought for them to stay planted in the house of God, their destinies could have been different. Wow. So it's those who love God that get connected to Him and fulfill His will. These are the people that will have the confidence on that day. Yeah. All right, that was my second point. Here's my third point, the great white throne. Mm -hmm. The great white throne has to do with Every soul, every single soul that is not in Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of times we confuse the great white throne with the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. The judgment seat of Christ happens before, yeah. during the seven year period. The yeah. great white throne happens after Armageddon. Wow. This is where every single person will be judged. And we see the great white throne in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. It says this, And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. Mm -hmm. The earth and sky fled from his presence but they found no place to hide. Wow. This is God now coming as righteous judge. Mm -hmm. Not to judge the works of the persons, right. but to judge their eternal fate. Anybody wow. who ends up in a great white throne, their destiny, their destiny is sealed. Wow. Their eternal fate is sealed. So here's my first point under this um, main point. The souls of the great white throne. I believe that the souls of the great white throne are under two categories. And the first category is the religious people. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Jesus says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will yeah. enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not about doing religious things. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name yeah. and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Wow. So it's not about doing great things. It's not about doing good things or religious things. It's about being an authentic, uh, being in an authentic relationship with Jesus. Yeah. It's about being real and following the will of God. This is the scariest verse for a lot of pastors because they know, a lot of pastors, we know that many of the people that listen to us while we preach will be found in this verse. Wow. The most heartbreaking thing. And that's why one of the things that I really like to teach our leaders and our, and our campus pastors now is, you know, you got to be real. Yeah. Have an authentic relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Grow your intimacy. And I know that sounds super cliche, mm -hmm. but the truth is this. It's so difficult sometimes to have a real authentic relationship with a God that you can't see. Yeah. True. But we need to. So I believe that a lot of religious people will be there. See, doing good things, doing religious things, <laughs> this is not what God is asking us to. Yeah. So a lot of people say, I don't want to get into the gospel. I don't want to become a, I don't want to become a Jesus follower because I'm not right. I'm not a good person. Dude, that's your requirement to be a Jesus follower. The requirement to be a Jesus follower is to not be a good person. Right. Jesus said, I don't come for the, for the healed. I don't come for those that are well. I come right. for the sick. I come that's for right. the broken. I come right. for the yeah. sinner. Right. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is that you don't have to change. Jesus is the one that transforms you through his love and his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy. Amen. So at the great white throne will be people that go to church, that prophesied, people that even cast out demons, wow. people that did ministry. Mm -hmm. And God was like, you never knew me wow. on earth. Wow. So I don't know you on this side of life. 
Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the first group of people is the religious people. Not the Jesus followers. Mm -hmm. The religious people. And then B, unrepentant sinners. Unrepentant sinners will be. And here are three passages that I want to read in regards to unrepentant sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, it says this. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Say it with me, one, two, three. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to say something very interesting here because now we've reached a point in our society that we can't talk about anything that we disagree It's getting to the point where sometimes, you know, most pastors, including myself, will be afraid to read this Bible verse. Why? Because it has the word homosexuality in it. And it's like scary now to talk about taboo topics. Uh We've gotten to the point in our society where we can't have a conversation that is mature, loving, right? And we can't have these conversations simply because we're scared. Mm -hmm. We're scared to read a verse... That belongs to the word of Almighty God, who created you, who created me. We're scared. That's right. That's right. I can't believe that we've gotten to the point where we have to debate if reading this scripture is allowed on social media or on any social media platform. Can you imagine that? I want to make some clarifications for any of you. Number one, because simply because we read this verse, which I know that everybody gravitates towards the word homosexuality. Right. Some people don't even have a listening ear and they automatically assume we hate homosexuals. Mm -hmm. This is not true. Crave Church is a space of grace for everyone. Crave Church is a space of grace for every single imperfect being, which means you and me because we're all imperfect. So just because we read a list of sins on this scripture doesn't mean that we're going to single one out, which is homosexuality. And be like, you're not welcomed and Crape Church is labeled as a church that doesn't accept homosexuals. Who said that? No one's saying that. Now, if you want to be someone that just is angry, uh, you know what? We'll pray for you. And if you want to label something that is not true, that's up to you. You're entitled to your own opinion just like we are. But the truth is this. That if we read these verses to you, which have a list, right? Sexual sin. Idol worship. Adultery, adultery is cheating on your spouse, Mm. right? Drunkenness, Mm -hmm. abusive, people who cheat. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that anyone that's found on this list could not come through our doors? Mm. Mm. Is that what this verse is saying? No. On On the contrary, Mm -hmm. this verse is saying, we want you to come. We love you so much that we're willing to tell you. Because wanted or not, Come on. Yeah. you're going to have to face your maker one day. Come on. Yeah. And it's right. best to know what his standards are. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't like his standards. Too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's his. Yeah. It's his call. He created yeah. you. He created the world. That's right. And you can disagree till your deathbed. Mm-hmm. But one day, you're going to have to face God. So I want to tell you where this verse is coming from. This verse is coming from a place of love that we do right. care about you so much. Yeah. It's like the analogy that I gave last week, a tsunami warning. If a tsunami was coming, I can't believe there would be people that would be like, why would you want to scare and panic the world and right. Vancouver? Right. We're not panicking anybody. We're warning. Because yeah. right. right. if there's a danger that's coming, the loving thing to do, if you know that it's going to happen, yeah. or you have faith yeah. that it's going to happen, and you know that it's going to happen, the loving thing to do is to warn. So I don't want you to pick up this verse that we read from God's word. I didn't dictate this. I didn't write this. I'm not smart enough to write any of this. It came from the Lord, his Holy Spirit. If we read this to you, I want you to know the place that we're coming from. The place that we're coming from is from a place of acceptance, love, and of warning to tell you this is what the word of God says. Now all this has to do with the Bible, which is the word, the holy word of God that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But if you don't believe that, we respect that too. We have to have a jump, a crossover, Uh and that bridge is called faith. As a follower of Jesus, I've placed my faith in his word. As Crave Church, we've placed our faith in his word. 
whatever culture says, whatever society says, whatever certain individuals say, that's totally respectable. We totally understand that there are different opinions. But as Crave Church and as the pastor of Crave Church, we're going to stand firm yep. yeah. on the word of God. Amen. And we're not discriminating anybody. Mm-hmm. We don't want to bully anybody. Yeah. But we're certainly not going to take a stance where we allow someone to bully us. Amen. That's right. Because this is the word of God. And we're going to stand on the word of God because the final, final moments of our existence don't depend on what culture said. Yes. That's right. That's right. The final moments of our existence depend on the word of God. Amen. Here's another verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, so remember this is unrepentant sinners at the great white throne. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. What are the results? Sexual morality, yeah. impurity, yeah. lustful pleasures, yeah. a lot of thirst, eh? Yeah. Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling. You wouldn't think that quarreling <laughs> would be a sin on the list wow. that says you ain't making it. Some of you are very contentious, quarreling people. And God is saying, repent, man. Hostility too. You're just so hostile to everything. If it doesn't agree with your opinion, you become hostile and quarrelsome. Terrible. Jealousy. Outburst of anger. Selfish ambition. Dissension. Division. Envy. Drunkenness. Wild parties. And other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, to be honest, we all make that list. I'm found in that list. And if you think that you're not found in that list, then can I get your autograph? You're an angel. (laughs) We're all found in that list. What is this trying to say? This is trying to say that those who don't live a repentant life from these things because these things were prone to them as human beings but it's one thing to practice your sin indulge in it and say this is who i'm gonna be and this is what i am and i'm gonna do it that's an unrepentant sinner versus a repentant sinner repentant sinner notice how repentant and sinner is one title Mm -hmm. meaning that we're all sinners and we're always going to sin until we die Mm -hmm. but there's a difference between those who practice their sin and those that fall into sin or stumble into sin i have my moments of weakness my moments of weakness and i've fallen i've had moments where i make a mistake and guess what i do i speak to my executive team where i practice accountability i speak to my pastor well one of the pastors i have three pastors that thank god have taken the decision to look over my life and keep me accountable they're much older than me some of them have amazing successful successful beautiful ministries that are fruitful which one day i'm god willing we're gonna have them preach at our church that you can meet them but i practice that where i tell them here's what i did here's what happened i messed up i stumbled and and this is what we call a repentance sinner Repentance is not a one-day thing where you pray and say, I give my life to Jesus and I repent of all my sins. Amen. (laughs) Right? That's not a repentant Christian. A repentant Christian is one that lives a lifestyle of repentance. Where when you do sin, your heart breaks. You have conviction and your heart goes, Oh, shoot, I can't believe I did that. A non-repentant sinner, which is the people that are going to be in the great white throne, they sin and they don't care. And that's what this verse is talking about. Here's the last verse on unrepentant sinners, Revelation 22, verse 15. Outside the city are all those who live like dogs. Mm. Pardon the language, but pardon not. (laughs) Those who do evil magic, so this is witchcraft, sorcery. Uh Those who sin sexually, well, like, people are thirsty. (laughs) Like, this list, like, it makes every list. Those who murder, those who worship idols, Mm. and those who love to lie and pretend to be good. Wow. Wow. This group of people that don't repent from these things, they won't make it to heaven and they'll make it to the great white throne. Wow. Once you're in the great white throne, it's over. Yeah. It's over for you. Yeah. Parents, you too. Once you make it to the great white throne, yeah. all your hope is gone. Yeah. If you think that what we're living through is despair and hopelessness, you are so, 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 so wrong. The great white throne, this judgment, that's real despair. That's hopelessness. All right, here are some foolish responses to sin. Number one, unlimited grace. (laughs) This is where people say, well, 
you know, Jesus died for all my sins, so I'm forgiven no matter what I do. So I don't need to take my sin very seriously because Jesus will forgive it. Sins are forgiven, right? Sex is a sin. Sins are forgiven. So stick it in. That's the mindset of a person that thinks unlimited grace. Did that rhyme? Yeah, it did. Here's number two. God knows my heart. <laughs> We've all heard this response. It's a yeah. foolish response to what's sin. Yeah. These are people who keep on sinning, yeah. but they always say, oh, but, but you know, God knows my, he understands. Right. This is when people think that they're the exception to what God has spoken. Right. And it's so easy to fall into that because right. we can have a misconstrued version of grace or misconstrued right. understanding of grace. Jesus does understand you, but he's provided his Holy Spirit to help you come out of your sin. Right. Another one is this. Let's change the subject. Oh. I didn't come to church to feel this way. Oh, no. This is when people change the subject the moment that you want to have a loving conversation that confronts their sin. Right. One of the tactics is that they try to change the subject of their sin to how you're making them feel about their sin. Which is a foolish response because, to be honest, we're just trying to help you. Yeah. Or your leader's trying to help you. Or your friend is trying to help you. Or your mom or your father are trying to help you. Or your siblings trying to help you. We're not trying to get you to feel bad, but the truth is this, that if you're doing something that's sinful, it's going to have a consequence, and we love you too much to see you bear those consequences, especially if it has to do with eternal fates. Yeah, yeah. And here's the last one, which is very confusing, is when they go, you're right, but they don't change. Wow. Can I tell you something? You guys are the most confusing human beings ever. <laughs> you say that, we're right, and you're like, yeah, you're right, you're right, and, and, and you have that like convicted feel and that vibe of like, yeah, I understand I'm going to change, but you never do. You go back to your sin and you roll on it like a pig in mud. Bruh. And whenever we have a conversation with you, you, you look like you get it. Yeah. You sound like you get it. Uh -huh. You give off a vibe that you're repentant, but you're not. Extremely confusing. All right, what's going to happen at the Great White Throne? Well, the books will be opened. Look what Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15 says. It says this, And I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. All right, we read that. Now listen to this. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is not hell. Hell is a waiting place for those that are going to be uh, thrown into the lake of fire after the great white throne. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So there's a couple of books that the Bible actually talks about. And I'm going to go through some of them with you. The first book is the book of works. In Revelation 20, 13, it says this, and they were judged each one according to his works. Mm -hmm. yeah. So people will be judged according to the works. There's a book that is going to be opened that has everybody's works recorded. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the great white, th not you, but whenever someone goes to the great white throne, this book of works is going to be opened and all your works will be judged. Mm -hmm. The second one is the book of words. Look what Matthew chapter 12 says. It says this, And I tell you this, that you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Your words now reflect your fate then. Your words now reflect your fate then. Either you will be justified by them or you will be condemned. Wow. So people that say, you know, if you're a Christian, it's okay if you swear. I think not. Mm -hmm. I think not. And then there's the book of secrets. Someone say, ouch. ouch. Someone say, spicy. spicy. This is a very spicy diary. The book of secrets. And this book of secrets is interesting because although you can hide from people, mm -hmm. the one you will never be able to hide from is God. Yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 16 says this. The day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. Wow. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says this. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Right. Wow. So there's a book that writes down all your secrets. <laughs> then there's the book of life. <laughs> oh <my God>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
The book of life is the most serious one. This is the final book. This is the big one. This is the big one at the end. Revelation chapter 21 says this. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter. Heaven, of course. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 20.15 reads this. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Everyone that's born gets their name printed or written in the book of life automatically. But those who are not in Christ, their name gets erased. Their name gets erased. I, I feel like I need to read a narrative to you that I have. I want you to listen to this narration. Morgan Wilson had the golf ball lined up properly. He was about to tap the ball in the hole when he suddenly clutched his chest and collapsed onto the green, onto the grass. The panicked voices of his buddies faded away as he felt himself traveling through a dark tunnel. All at once, he was in a mode of existence unlike anything he had, never, he had ever experienced on earth. Unknown to him, he was in Hades, the abode of the wicked as they await the day of judgment. Hades is like hell. There were many other souls around him. More continued to flock in. Their bodies were like his own, wispy and insubstantial, but with all senses intact. At one end of the room, guarding the massive door, stood a man-like figure who was so bright that Morgan could hardly look at him. One by one, the waiting souls were called to the door, and when Morgan's turn came, he passed through the door, and what he saw took his breath away. His eyes strained, taken by the otherworldly beauty and majesty. Directly before towered a great white throne. He looked into the face of the one sitting on it, and he was undone. The face radiated pure love and infinite sorrow. In that instant, Morgan realized that this face, this being, had somehow always been the reality behind every longing that he had ever had. With a stab of fear, Morgan realized that he was in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Panic welled up in him as he reflected on his earthly life, which had not always been what it ought to have been. In a rich, pure voice, Christ called Morgan by name. Morgan was drawn forward like a magnet. For the first time, he noticed that there was some books, that there were some books stacked on a table beside the throne. Jesus Christ picked up the first one and Morgan got a glimpse of its title the book of the law. Christ opened the book and set it on his lap. Morgan Wilson, he said, what do you have to say about your life on earth? In spite of his trembling, Morgan found his voice. Well, uh, uh, I, I, I tried my best to obey your laws. And, and when I think of other people, I think I did better than most. Very well, since you expect to be saved by your good works, let's consider what that requires. Looking at the book, Jesus reviewed aloud each point of the law and then looked at Morgan. Have you done all these things? Well, not perfectly, of course, but the, the good outweighs the bad. Well, I'm afraid that that's not good enough, Christ said. If you base your salvation on the law, you must keep all the law, obeying every single point without fail. But if that's the case, then who can be saved, Morgan said. The Bible says that everyone who sins, we, that everybody sins and that we all fall short. You are exactly right, said the Lord Jesus. That's why I died for you. I never sinned. I took the penalty for your sin in order to free you from it. He closed the book of the law and picked up the next volume, Morgan Wilson's Book of Works. As he opened it, Morgan's fear began to ease. I mean, he had done many good works and he felt sure the Lord would be really impressed says here that you gave $1,000 to your church's new building fund. That's right, Morgan said. And I set an example by being the first one to do it. I also did many other good things. I was a deacon at my church. I occasionally taught Sunday school, and I never missed a church service, even on Wednesday. And I seldom fall asleep during the sermons. <laughs> yes, all these things were recorded in here. But it's also recorded that you made sure that all of these things were visible to other people. Wow. You did it for them. Wow. Suddenly, Morgan felt exposed. He could muster no response. 
Christ closed the book and reached for the next one. Morgan Wilson's Book of Secrets. You've got a lot of entries in this book, Morgan. What a savage. Let's look at some of the things that you did in secret. It says here, you reported business losses that you did not incur and inflated the amount of your charitable gifts. You cheated on your income tax. And according to your words, you did it every year. It says here, you visited several porn sites late at night. And to top things off, it is written that you had a long-running affair with a woman in your church. Wow. None of these deeds were ever found out. And since they never damaged your reputation, you never repented of them. Wow. The bottom line is, you did your good work publicly and your evil ones in secret. Wow. Wow. You should have done the opposite. You should have done your good works in secret and received my reward instead of the praise of people and confessed your evil deeds and bad works so that you could repent. Mm -hmm. Morgan looked down in shame as Christ closed Morgan Wilson's book of secrets and reached for the next one. Morgan Wilson's book of words. I see two categories of words in this book, he said. Those that reflected the attitude of your heart and those that hid the attitude of your heart. Mm -hmm. The two categories are sometimes paired. I mean, for example, when you were an employee, you flattered your supervisor in your salary review meeting and at lunch on the same day, you told your coworker that he was so dumb that if he was going to speak his mind, he would be mute. You also hardly ever read your Bible, yet you quoted verses you memorized to impress the ladies that went to your church. Jesus is savage. <laughs> Who's a Morgan in our church? Just kidding. You spoke to the young adults in your church to keep their speech clean while you knew in your heart that you, that your own speech with your golfing buddies was completely vile. Wow. Christ shook his head and he closed the book. There still seemed one more book and Morgan asked, is there any way that that last book can override all that's been written in all these other books? And Jesus picked up the heavy book and said, this is the book of life. The name of every person ever born has been entered into this book. Tragically, however, many of the names no longer appear. They have been blotted out. Please, Morgan said, please open that book and see if by any chance my name is still there. Jesus turned slowly through the pages, scanning each one and finally closed the book and looked at Morgan sadly. I'm sorry to say to you that your name is not here. You do not belong to me wow. but what about grace morgan said can't you give me grace morgan my grace was always available to you all you had to do was place your trust in me and make me the lord of your life had you done that my grace would have freely covered all your sins wow. and all your failures wow. but you never did that you never surrendered to me and allowed me into your heart therefore you never knew me and now, I don't know you. An angel led Morgan to another door. This one was dark and ominous. There he was thrown into darkness. He tried to find a place to stand, but he had no weight and was just falling into darkness. He called and cried out into the emptiness, but his voice was swallowed up by the darkness. Morgan Wilson couldn't see anything. No sun, no moon, no creation, no life, not a single ray of light. He had now stepped into a hopeless reality where regret and anguish will be the smallest of tortures his eternal fate could ever offer. So here's my conclusion. No one is really thinking or planning for Judgment Day. Which is a real day that's actually going to be coming. No one's really planning for it. No one really thinks about it. We think about future days like, what am I going to do in 10 years? We think about our wedding day. Who am I going to marry? We think about the day that we start our business. We think about many things. The day that we're going to achieve a certain goal. But the one thing that matters most is the one thing we don't think about. That is when you stand before God. You're a true, real soul. You're a genuine, real soul. And your reality is that one day you will stand before God. You will face your maker. I pray that this is something that stirs up your mind and really makes you reflect that you are a true soul that one day will stand before God. And I generally hope that it's at the judgment seat of Christ and not the great white throne. 
Here's a verse that I want to share to close. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he makes himself available. Call to him while he is nearby. I genuinely pray that you allow Jesus to be the Savior of your soul. And I genuinely pray that if you've walked away from your faith, you've walked away from your Savior, that you walk back to him today. Yeah. I'm going to make a prayer for all of you that want to repent. If the Holy Spirit is leading you in this moment to repent, if the Holy Spirit is leading you now to walk back to the Lord, I want you to make this prayer with me, with all sincerity, with all your heart. Close your eyes right there where you are. And if your mother, your father, your siblings are there, honestly, screw the embarrassment. Don't even be shy. This is more important than a two-minute prayer that you're going to make. Close your eyes with me. And I want you to zone everybody in the room out. Like I said, this two-minute prayer, feeling embarrassed is nothing. Paled. It pales in comparison to what you're going to face if you're without Christ. So I pray that your parents or your friends or whoever you're watching it with, pray that you don't even consider any type of embarrassment right now. That's just foolishness to me. So zero in. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Father in heaven, I thank you for your warning. I thank you for your word. Thank you for letting me know what you're really looking for and for providing a way for my soul to be saved. Thank you because you don't leave us in the dark, in the air, or guessing. You clearly speak. So tonight, this morning, or this afternoon, I give my life to Jesus. And I want to open my heart to allow Jesus to be the Savior of my soul. Help me grow in understanding of who you are and in my relationship with you. Holy Spirit of God, lead me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the conclusion of our third week of If the World Was Ending. Uh, this was a very powerful message, I believe. I felt the Holy Spirit all over it. Next week is the final installment, and we're going to be looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is our way to be saved. I'm really excited about this. Um, we're in a lockdown right now, but I believe that God's in control. And I pray that even more souls get to watch us since it's going to be at the comfort of their own homes. So I want you to do something with me. Next week is the message of the gospel. We present Jesus and the purpose of God and Jesus and the cross. Let's work together during this quarantine time yeah. to really allow the kingdom of God to enter into the hearts of those that need to be saved. Yeah. I asked a couple of leaders before the lockdown, I said, what do you want our church to look like in two weeks? Right now we can't meet in our campuses. We can't have church. But I refuse to think that our church should stop its momentum and its growth. Yeah. And the question I really want to ask people is this. What do you want our church to look like when we come out of these lockdowns? A dwindling, dying, drying church? Or do you want it to be something that is soaked, passionate, yeah. filled with the fire of God's presence, yeah. Amen. with the momentum yes. that we've been seeing? Right? Those are the two options. And these two options, one of these two is made possible through you. Yeah. So I pray in the name of Jesus that as we enter this lockdown, which we started you know, today or yesterday. No, wait. <laughs> we started on Thursday. Because yeah. yeah. today's Sunday. You're watching this on Sunday. As we enter this lockdown, let us enter with a positive mindset that we're going to keep on moving. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. I love you all, and I'll see you here next week. Take care.